Uh, we're a London-based uh, software and services company, specialising in risk management, particularly in cyber and information security. <coughs> uh, the, my agenda for today, I'm going to talk a little bit of background um, uh, about the difference between qualitative quantitative approaches, why a quantitative approach to risk assessment we think is becoming more and more important. Um, we'll break in for a practical demonstration part way through and then come back and talk at the end a little bit about how we can use quantitative techniques to help us to evaluate investments in cyber security uh, products and services. So to move straight on, um, I noticed this report from the World Economic Forum published in November last year and it was about the regional risks for doing business and um, cyber attacks is now the number one risk for doing business in, in North America, followed by data fraud or, or theft. And these are ahead of extreme weather events, fiscal crises, energy price shocks, terrorist attacks and, and so on. And, and what really interested me actually was the fact that in three regions around the world now, cyber attacks are the number one risk for doing business. So this is, this is as all of us in this room will be aware, you know, a, really, a really big issue. And that's um, prompting business leaders to, to ask a whole range of questions. You know, it's really a broad issue now. Business leaders want to know what level of cyber risk are we facing? How much could we do? If we to suffer a breach, could we tolerate that sort of level of loss? What are the priority risks to address? And what are the priority actions that we need to take to address those risks? And what level of cyber insurance cover do we need? So cyber insurance as, a, as an industry is growing rapidly. And also, given the uh, ever-increasing cost of cyber security solutions in Gartner, uh, predicting global spend on security products and services to increase by 8.7% to $124 billion in 2019. So that's prompting the question, how can we make a financial appraisal of, of cyber security investment proposals? All of these questions are very difficult to, to answer if we don't understand the financial implications of, of cyber breaches. Okay. So, what I'll just have a look at now is what we mean by <coughs> quantitative cyber security assessment. And before I do that, if any of you are interested in learning more about this, there's a very good book by Douglas Hubbard called How to Measure Anything in, in Cyber Security Risk. Uh, if you want the background to what I'm talking about today uh, in, in a lot more detail, then that, that's a good book to, to have a read on. So let's think about um, just sort of traditional approaches to cyber risk assessment. So any of you that have been involved in, in risk assessment, whether it's for information risk or enterprise risk management or, or whatever, you've probably seen something like this. Um, this is a 5 by 5 heat map, we t we, it tends to be used uh, to plot uh, risks using ordinal scales, in this case it's 5 by 5 severity and likelihood. Um, we tend to apply these to twice, once to our inherent uh, risk assessment and then once to our residual risk assessment and we've taken some action to, to address the risk. The problem with the qualitative approach is it's very difficult to measure financial loss using that sort of approach. Even if we say that uh, the four on the severity scale equates to a million dollar loss, for example, and the C equates to 50% chance of loss, saying that we're going to lose half a million dollars is a very difficult thing to say and not a very credible thing to say, as I hope I'll try and demonstrate to you as, as we go through the demonstration. So if we're looking to measure in financial terms and to understand the financial impact of or cyber risk, uh, then we need to start to look at something like this. And if we're measuring financial loss, then we can certainly, oops, sorry. We can certainly talk about the most likely, at the top right here, because the, the, the most likely loss that might result if we have a, a cyber breach. Um, and that's the highest probability loss, but there's also a smaller probability that the loss might be less. 
or a small probability that the, the loss might actually be much higher. So there's actually a range or a distribution of loss um, in, in, in practice in terms of what can happen. At the top left there, if we're talking about the number of times we might uh, experience a loss, if we say that we think we might experience a, a fishing attack or something like that five times a year, a loss from a fishing attack five times a year on average, then perhaps that's the highest probability, but in any one year we might have five or four or three or seven or eight or none, um, each with different sort of levels of probability. So we get a more realistic approach if we can combine um, our distributions of severity of loss with our distribution of frequency then we get something looking a little like that red curve just there. So we'll have um, a level of loss that's most likely uh, but there will be other losses that are, that are possible as well. So the question then comes, well, what do these distributions actually look like for cyber? And, and, and that then becomes uh, a bit of a problem. Uh, because if we have if we had lots of data <coughs> on cyber breaches, then we could plot the results on distributions and we'd have a good understanding of, of what those distributions look like. Unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of data. It's growing. We're getting more incident data all the time, but comparing one incident and one breach with another is very difficult and the context in which those breaches occur can be quite different as well. Uh, but there is some somewhere that we can go to for help. Um, and in financial services, the financial services sector has for a long time now been, quanti been quantifying risk in financial terms. They quantify credit risk, market risk, and for quite a few years now they've been quantifying operational risk in financial terms as well because they have to calculate the level of capital that's at loss and make sure they've got reserves to cover those potential losses. And this is a, a survey from 2018 of the top 10 operational risks by, by RiskNet <coughs> identifies IT disruption and data compromise as the two top operational risks. An operational risk is defined um, by the Solvency 2 regulation for insurers, the risk of loss arising from inadequate or failed internal processes, people, systems, or external events. And cyber and information security is uh, clearly, I think, we can see from here, an operational risk. So operational risk has been modelled for some time within the financial services sector. Um, and there's a survey that was done in 2015 from the Institute of Risk Management, looked at the approaches that were being taken to model operational risk in financial services. They found that um, there's no one-size-fits-all approach, but of those that responded to the survey, 65% said that they used different distributions for, for frequency and severity of losses. And of those, 73% use a log normal distribution for severity. So this is an example of a log normal distribution. So you can see here that the, uh, the expected loss or the most likely loss is just over $2 million. And the chance of that is between 25 and 30%. But there's a small chance it could be less than that. There's a small chance, a very small chance that it could be 12, 13, 14 million dollars. Okay. Similarly, they found that 86% of people that were modelling operational risk in financial services were using a Poisson distribution for the frequency. And this is an example of the Poisson distribution. So the red curve there has an average um, uh, frequency of 10. Uh, but you can see, uh, and that's the chance of that is about 10% in the next year that we'll have 10 breaches if we think the average is 10. Uh, we might have 987, we might have 15, 16 at lower levels of probability. The good thing about the Poisson distribution is that it can also model uh, likelihoods uh, that are less than one. So the top distribution there is 0.2, which is once every five years. And again, it's showing us that the chance of uh, it happening in the next year is, is about 30%. Um, so once in the next year, but there's a small percentage that it could happen 10 times in, in the next year. Okay. So if we <coughs> accept that a good approximation is that we can use a log normal distribution for measuring the severity of cyber breaches, 
Um, then there are a couple of things that we can do to make it easier for us to apply this sort of technique. So if we know the range, the lower bound and the upper bound, that our losses might fit within, and we, and we know the confidence interval, then we can estimate and work out what the most likely loss would be. So in this example, we're saying, um, if we have a breach, then we're 90% confident that it's going to be between $0.4 million cost us between $0.4 million and, and $2 million at a 90% confidence interval, which means there's a 5% chance it could be lost less than $0.4 million. There's a 5% chance it could be greater than $2 million. And if we do that, we can work out on the lot normal distribution that actually the most likely loss is $0.8 million. If we then say, um, we think the average frequency of this event based on our incident history and so on is about uh, four times a year, which is the green distribution there. Then we can come up with the most likely loss that we're going to suffer is $3.2 million in the next year. Okay, it could be less than that, it could be more than that, but the most likely loss that we're going to suffer is $3.2 million. The final um, finding that came out of the Institute of Risk Management survey um, related to aggregating this data together. So you can work out the, the most likely loss for each of your risks, but when you combine them together, you can't simply just add up those expected loss figures and come up with a, with a big number. Um, what, we, what we can do is we can combine those distributions statistically. So we can use something like Monte Carlo analysis, um, that goes through a number of iterations and it randomly selects points on each of those two distributions and combines them together. And it does that many, many times. And the more, more iterations that you run of that sort of analysis, uh, the better the data that you get coming out of it. And that, that allows us to create some quite interesting reports. Now this might be a little bit difficult to see the numbers on on the side of this, uh, but this is this is a loss exceedance curve, and it's showing us so the, the thick line at the top is is showing us the the aggregate risk that we have combining multiple risks together, and it's giving us information on the probability that our losses will exceed a particular level. So, for example, on here at the top, almost at the top, I can see there's a ninety percent chance that we could lose more than a million dollars in the next year. As we move further over to the right, I can see there's a 60% chance that we could lose more than 5 million, and all the way down to the bottom, there's a 10% chance that we could lose more than $10 million. Okay, so we get that from aggregating all of these risks together. What we can also do, and the, the lower line there, the dotted line, is, is management's tolerance for risk. So you can actually go to, to management and say, what sort of level of loss are we prepared to accept from a cyber breach? You know, if we, you know, if we're to lose a million dollars, for example, in the next year, what's a tolerable sort of level of probability of that? Are you prepared to accept a ten percent chance that we'll lose more than a million dollars, five percent chance? And what about five million dollars? And what about ten million dollars? And so, on. I'm not saying it's an easy conversation to have, uh, but there are some techniques that can be applied uh, to, to this to try to sort of tease that information out. And that book that I put up, um, the Hubbard book, provides some good examples of how you can, you can sort of get that sort of information out. Uh, but I think it becomes quite powerful then when we can report in this sort of way, because at the top we've got a, our sort of a, a quantitative loss exceedance curve, which is showing us where we sit at the moment. Uh, and the dotted line is showing us what management is prepared to accept. So you can see here we've got a huge gap between the two, so we need to do something about that. I'm going to move on to the demonstration in a second. Before I do that, I just wanted to put up one more slide. Um, and that's just to sort of to outline the fact that when we're talking about cyber risk, it's complex. There's a whole range of different factors to, 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 to consider. 
that are interrelated. So if we're worried about cyber risks, particularly adversarial cyber risks, um, then clearly we're concerned about threats, um, who might attack us, you know, the motivation, the capability of, of those attackers and so on. So we need to understand the potential threats that we're facing. Uh, but also, if we've experienced incidents, if we've not got to the root cause of those incidents, um, then they're an indicator of potential future risk that we're facing. Similarly with, with near misses, um, so if we've had a number of near misses, um, that's going to give us some contextual information. We need to understand the controls that are, that are mitigating our risks, um, how effective they are, how well deployed are they. Something like PCI compliance, you have to prove on a regular basis that the controls that you're deploying are effective. And if they're not, or if they fall out of compliance, for example, then we're going to be sitting with a higher risk. Vulnerabilities that, that we have, uh, exploited, vulnerabilities that could be exploited by threats, critical vulnerabilities that could be exploited by threats that could allow access to our crown jewels, assets, our highly sensitive data, business processes, and so on. Uh, results from tests, penetration test results, business continuity tests, those sorts of things, all of these are going to indicate, provide information which is going to build a picture on our risk status. In the issues that we've got, so not risks, not things that might happen, but things that you know, have happened that relate to risk. Um, you know, problems with resourcing on critical security projects or, or something like that that's going to delay the delivery of that, of that solution. Audit findings, again, telling us what's happening in practice. And out of all of these, we're going to identify and probably raise a whole range of actions that we need to take. Many of them will be uh, interrelated to each other. But until we Taken those actions, we've completed what we said we're going to do, we've tested that they're effective. Until we've done that, then we're still sitting at a, at a level of risk. So, all of this is just explaining the sort of the, the, the complexity and uh, the interrelation between these different factors and also the fact that they change all the time. So, things can change, new incidents can come in, new vulnerabilities can be uh, identified, issues can be raised, and so on. But the more visibility we have, then the more chance we have of really understanding the risk and making a, a, a sensible assessment of the risk. So what I'd like to do now then is just um, jump over and show you a quick example. I'll just sit down for this. So this is a um, this is our stream uh, platform that has a home page. Um, it's, it's configurable to, to, to the logged in user, so you see the, the data that's of interest to you as a, as a logged in user. Um, and we just have an example here of a number of widgets on the dashboard which are summarising the number of red, amber, green risks we've got, uh, the status of our security metrics, how we're doing against ISO 27001 and GDPR, um, across the, the middle, some widgets on the status of issues, incidents, and all their findings, and then schedule information at the bottom. And I'm just going to navigate over to look at um, some risk dashboarding. Uh, this is sort of a representation of our organisation in the left, left column here. Uh, and we're opened up on a, on, a, sorry, on a UK trading risk register. And so this is a list of risks. So those of you that have been involved in risk assessment before will know about risk registers and, and sort of lists of, of risks and so on. And um, they're, they're at a fairly high level, loss of portable devices, unauthorised access to data. This is all relating to UK trading data, denial of service and, and, and so on. And, if, and then just as we go across here, then we can see that we've got a red risk here um, and we've got a number of amber and green risks and they're summarised at the top here. And these, these risks are being mitigated by various controls. This is the average performance of those controls. And I'm just going to open up a, a risk now. And this is a slight, slightly small writing, I'm sure, so I'll just describe the, the key points. But on the left side here, then we just have a description of the risk. It's unauthorized access to data at rest or in use. Uh, we have a description, a category as we come down then. Configurable fields here, and we're capturing information on 
for business indicators that could be affected if this risk was to materialise. We've got a description of, of, of what those what that impact might be. So it might be that um, uh, if we have um, preventable loss of trading customer data, for example, that might affect our ability to retain customers, it might affect our ability to acquire new customers. We can estimate the financial impact of that. And then further down we can, we can capture other information. Uh, I'm just going to drag this across a bit. In the right column here, then at the top we have our quantitative risk assessment widget, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, but as we go down the page, then we can see that we've got information on the controls that are mitigating this particular risk, the relative importance of each of those controls and how they're performing at the moment. Uh, we've got some inf information here on actions, including those that are overdue, so there's a, an action here for urgent completion of the Secure Authentication Project, review of the Privilege Management Policy. Uh, we've got a couple of issues that have been raised, incident data breach that we've had uh, last year, and a former employee access the trading system. We've had got a near miss down here, and we've got an audit finding. Okay, so it's just illustrating um, an understanding, trying to understand uh, that, that sort of relative data that we that we looked at um, earlier in terms of trying to get a better understanding of, of the risks that we're facing. So what we've got at the top here then is a is a risk assessment that we've completed. And what we're saying here is that if this risk was to materialise, um, then we think, based on previous event history and so on, that the loss is going to be between a million and five million dollars with a 90% confidence interval. So 90% of the time the loss is going to be between that, those two bounds. And based on our, again, history and the other information which is informing us about the risk, we're, we're thinking that actually the frequency is likely to be 0.5 times a year, which means once every two years. That's our average frequency. And on the basis of that, then we've estimated a, a loss of 1.26 million dollars. So that's the most likely loss that we think we could achieve from uh, this this sort of risk if it was to materialise. Okay. So on the dashboard here on the risk register. There were a series of risks within UK trading. There's only this one that's red, the others are amber and green. But if we go over to look at the loss exceedance curve for UK trading, then this has aggregated all of those risks together. Um, and this is showing us, uh, for example, down here, it was a 40% chance of us losing more than $5 million. And currently, management's um, tolerance for that is about 15%. So there's this gap between our current <coughs> risk status and management's tolerance for risk. Okay. This green curve here is showing us the level of risk that we can potentially get down to if we improve all of those controls that we're mitigating the risk, and some of them are quite poorly performing. Um, so if I just go back, to my risk. This, this expected loss here is modelling the current state, it's modelling what we're expecting to lose based on the controls that we've got implemented, their current state, our incident history and, and so on. Um, but if I take action to, to improve the performance of the control, and this control is looking at, um, it's measuring, um, it's a metric, and it's looking at the, the use of two-factor authentication um, by administrators to, to access this, this data. And currently, that's red because this project is only part way through. So we're saying here two factor authentication is not currently, currently implemented for all administrators on the UK trading system. There's an action that we saw earlier that's been raised to, to address that. If we assume that we come back and that project has now been complete and we've fully implemented two factor authentication. This control is now showing 100% deployed. And if we go back to our risk assessment, then we've re-estimated that expected loss. We've re-estimated that the, um, uh, the frequency of breaches uh, could reduce. 
So we're talking about maybe once every five years now, rather than once every two years. Okay. But this is, again, it's supposed to reflect the real state. So you continue to monitor the situation. Uh, and if you something happens, it makes you think actually that there's a higher likelihood of this sort of breach occurring and you can just adjust it. And let's say you think it's going to happen once every three years on average, something like that. So the nice thing about quantitative assessment, you're not only measuring financial loss, but you're, you're measuring the current state. And as things change, you can update that current state and you can update your risk assessment. So if I just go back to my loss exceedance curve, we can easily aggregate up across the business. So if we want to, say, have a look at the Europe region, then this is what the Europe region loss exceedance curve looks like. And that consists of the UK, Germany, and Italy. So all of their individual loss exceedance curves being combined together to give this view, again, still, still way above management's tolerance to risk. So the question is, what do we do to close, to close the gap still? So one thing that we can do if we're, if we're measuring risk quantitatively is that we can go to something called a Control Improvement Priority Report. This is looking at UK trading, it's looking at the security metrics that we're tracking for UK trading. If I just drag this across a bit, uh, we can see here that, um, and this is sorted um, by an estimate of the reduction in expected loss that would result if we took action to improve those metrics. Okay, so top metric here is about screening of staff during the recruitment process. The next one's about data on portable devices being encrypted um, and, and so on as we, as we go down. And we're seeing these in sort of priority order of uh, in, improvement. So those control improvements that are going to give us potentially the greatest reduction in our expected loss. So if we go back to the the loss exceedance curve. So this is just recalculating. This is running on 50,000 iterations. But what, what we can also do then is say, okay, well, let's project the improvement of, of some of these controls. So this is the same loss exceedance curve, it's just been squashed into the left hand side of the screen here. Um, what we can do is to say, well, let's assume that we apply, we approve, improve the top five controls. This is in the Europe view at the moment. Let's assume that we improve the performance of those top five controls and then show the report. And then what you can see here is that the, the loss exceedance curve, it's projected where that loss exceedance curve would move to if we took action to improve those top five controls, okay, by, by priority. So this is the sort of thing that you can do um, with, with quantitative risk assessment, and it's just not possible to, to do this sort of thing with, um, with qualitative approaches to cyber security. I'll just go back to, to my presentation now. I just wanted to I'll just come back and talk a little bit about what we also see as quite a big issue is how, how you can apply these sorts of techniques to, um, to estimate the benefit of cybersecurity solutions, products and services. And what do we mean when we talk about investment appraisals of, of security? I found this quote by Bruce Schneier from 2008. Um, he said, security is not an investment that provides a return like a new factory or financial instrument. It's an expense that hopefully pays for itself in cost savings. Security is about loss prevention and not about earnings. And I don't, I don't want to get drawn into the semantics, but, but I agree it's, it's about reduction in loss or reducing the probability of loss. Yes, we can say that cybersecurity is an enabler for, for digitalization and so on, but it's enabling it by 
reducing the risk of something bad happening during that exploitation of, of digitalization. So what we're really doing is looking to balance the, uh, the reduction in financial loss or reducing the probability of financial loss that can come from deploying cybersecurity solutions against the additional cost of, of doing that. I was at the event a couple of weeks ago presenting on the same topic um, and we ran a couple of audience polls. There were about 150 people in the room, mainly Chief Information Security Officers. And I asked the question, um, how many of you or, or, or your organisations have tried to apply return on investment techniques to security? And um, these were the results. So 26% hadn't tried, 17% tried but considered unsuccessful. 28% tried and moderately successful, 13% tried and successful. So almost something like 43% getting on for 50% had either not tried or had tried unsuccessfully. Only 13% had successfully managed to, to apply ROI techniques to security investments. And the second question that I put in the poll was, well, what were those difficulties? Um, you know, what what were they if you tried it, or what did you anticipate they would be if you hadn't tried it? And they were allowed to, to select more than one answer in this case. Um, and the highest uh, result there was, was the difficulty they had in assessing the reduction in financial loss that could come from applying security techniques. The second one was then gaining acceptance of, of the results. Okay, so or I can do some sort of assessment, but if you present it to management, then are they, are they going to accept those results? And they were the two highest findings that came out of, of that survey. Um, also, assessing the cost of the controls was considered difficult, 39%. 30% said it was approaches too complicated. 12% too simplistic. 21% had difficulty communicating the results. Okay, so Maybe it's just worth thinking a little bit about why that is. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that this, this sort of complexity that exists in, in cyber security. So this is a, from a report I found from the Information Security Forum, and it was on data leakage prevention. Uh, this briefing paper that they produced, good paper actually, you can find it online. And, um, and this sort of illustrates on the left-hand side there, um, that there's, there's potentially, if we're talking about enterprise data leakage solutions, then there's a, there's a range of sensitive data that we might want to apply these, this solution to, personal data, customer data, intellectual property, and so on. And there's also a whole range of different channels by which that data could be leaked. So email, internet, reusable media, devices, um, collaboration platforms, and, and, and so on. There's also different types of threat that could be malicious activity from somebody with, within an organisation. The Buca breach um, was a deliberate data leakage by uh, an employee. Could be negligent activity, so just you know, not, not taking good care. Could be completely accidental. Um, and, and each of these, you, you, know, you apply different additional controls to protect against malicious activity, negligent activity, accidental activity and so on. So it, it's, it's complex and, um, and what doesn't work is actually just trying to come up with a figure, or generally that's what this survey showed, just coming up with a figure that says you think we're going to lose 148,750 pounds, we spent 250, sorry, 25,000 without an ROI of 4.95 uh, ROI. That sort of thing doesn't generally um, catch the attention of, of, of the senior managers when they're looking at trying to evaluate these proposals. And I think the quantitative approach you know, gives you the potential to have richer data. So again, coming back to, to our loss exceedance curve, if this is our current state, what we can do then is to model perhaps the um, introduction of an enterprise data loss prevention product and aggregate uh, the effect that that will have on, on the risks and see what that does to, to our loss exceedance. So we can bring that information together 
Uh, we can talk in terms of reducing the probability of, of suffering financial loss. Uh, we can bring that together with other data and start to build, I think, a better business case for, for security solutions. Just to bring things to conclusion then, quantitative approach facilitates more realistic assessments of risk and evaluation of security investments. It brings us more into line with what organisations are doing in operational risk, credit risk, market risk and so on. It's been overdue for a long time, actually, I think, in the cyber risk area. We are getting more data on breaches, um, but people like Douglas Hubbard have really explained very well in that book um, how you can start to apply these techniques to cyber security. Uh, we need to model the current state and the projected state um, to understand the benefit of potential investment. We do need to try to uh, maintain visibility of these complex relationships in, in, in cyber security. The more visibility we have, the better we can manage our risk. Uh, it does require technology for visualisation, statistical analysis and reporting. Can't do it very easily, I would say, at all on a spreadsheet. If any of you would like a demonstration of us of our screen platform, uh, please please contact me afterwards. Um, and we are running a webinar if anybody's interested on quantifying the benefits of cyber security investment. So it's taken a deep dive into what we've just been looking at on quantifying the benefit of cyber security investment. That's on the 10th of April at two o'clock in the afternoon. And again, if you want to our website, you're very welcome to to sign up for that.